So welcome to the interview portion of the podcast. I'm really, really excited about this topic. Our little pre-interview chat, I was just like, oh gosh, I wish I could record it right now. And I want to invite uh, or welcome, I should say, Andrea Height to the podcast. Andrea, welcome. Thank you, Michelle. So Andrea, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you're doing, and the topic we're going to talk about today. Well, my history starts in Australia where I grew up and my first oral health role was in the practice of pediatric dentistry for the Tasmanian State Health Department. Uh, after marrying an American, I moved to the United States and really my entire career has been in community and public health. Uh, as well as working with emerging DSOs and other delivery models. I, I think I have to say I am simply very passionate about the importance of oral health as part of overall health. And I'm really so pleased today to talk about the very essential critical role of the hygienist in improving health outcomes. That's Let's see if that was working. There we go. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm so excited um, about this. So the hygienist, the essential role of hygiene and oral health outcomes. And if you're listening to this on the podcast, um, there is going to be a PowerPoint that Andrea refers to, and we are going to be putting that on our website or in the show notes. So just like a heads up, if you hear her uh, talk about something on the uh, the slide or uh, reference something at all, a quote or information, it will be found within the show notes that will be a link to our website. So, um, Andrea, let's take it away. All right. So what I really want to focus on today is how we elevate your contribution as a hygienist into outcomes for the practice, the clinic, where you're working and what this means to patients. And so with the PowerPoint that you will have access to, part of what I've done is created in such a way that if you want to then use it to present to a dentist leader or other leader of your oral health program or your practice, you've got some tools and information that you can use as backup as you discuss with them and as you look at making recommendations for changes. So, and I knew this would happen, Next thing you know, my screen's not changing. All right, I'm going to start with the principle of the triple aim of healthcare. This has been driving what insurance, as well as what federal government has been doing over the last several years to more cost effectively get populations healthier and to improve patient experience. And really this is where oral health is so important because we in dental already know that you need to have good oral health, a uh, healthy periodontal tissue as well as part of managing your overall health. And when that happens, um, other costs go down. These are all linked, the body is linked. So as we look at what we're doing, we're looking at making the patient experience more meaningful, making doing so cost effective, and helping the patients become healthier at exactly the same time. And they're all very compatible. So of course, you as a hygienist can have a really, really powerful impact on what happens with patients. Firstly, patients are more likely to go to the dentist at least once or twice a year, as opposed to the fact that maybe they don't go to their physician every year. Maybe they only go when they're sick, but they're certainly likely not going for checkups twice a year with their physician, whereas you've got this regular contact and it's more extended time. If you think about, well, I'll think about the last time I went to see my doctor, um, I think I spent five minutes with her 
<laughs> and she zipped through quite a few things, but it was about five minutes because I'm nice and healthy. So it was a checklist and it was the standard, well, it's an annual checkup, let's get your blood work done, make sure it's all good, nice to see you, bye bye. Whereas when you're looking at what you're doing in the practice, you can spend a lot of time with the patient and you typically do. Now, last time I went to my dentist, I spent a good amount of time with my hygienist, but I thought about it. Um, we talked about my most recent trips. We talked about her new baby. We talked about a whole bunch of very interesting things. But I realized afterwards, she didn't really ask me about my health. And this oh. is where I wanted to talk about the fact that if you can go to your clinical lead, your dentist or whoever, and discuss how you can enhance your interaction with patients, you can make such a difference for them, reinforcing what they need to do to be healthier. And you are a health authority. I mean, look how much time you've spent going to school. So within your scope, you have a great deal of ability to do a number of enhancing things. Like I said, let's start with the fact you can spend more time with the patient. Uh, perform health assessments. Are you taking their blood pressure, pulse, uh, pulse ox, mm -hmm. all of that? Are you looking at their medications and asking them basic questions like, all right, how are you doing and taking your medications regularly? Do you have enough medications? Have you talked to your physician recently about whatever it happens to be? And of course, when we look at chronic life-threatening diseases, asking patients about such things as what is their diet regimen? How are they doing complying with diet or exercise recommended by their physician? to help manage conditions such as diabetes and hypertension. You have the potential to uncover issues where you can either provide education, educational material, you can report back to the dentist on issues you've uncovered, and you can refer back to a primary care provider where there are concerns. And this way, you are really stepping up as part of the primary care team and reinforcing with the patient their health. You have a wonderful opportunity here to make a huge difference. Um, and once again, you've got great skills. Why squander those skills when you can really, really enhance the impact you can have? And then of course, we didn't even get to periodontal health and right. how important that is to systematic health. Michelle, were you going to say something about that? Well, I was just looking at your slide and it says um, on there something that I think is so critical, not so as much about the perio part that you were definitely going to dive into, but um, you say patients often find the hygienist to be less intimidating than the dentist, which supports more open communication, relationship building, and divulging of important health information. And I read that and I know that I think we've all as hygienists experienced that moment where like the doctor left the room after giving a recommendation and the patient kind of looks up at you and goes like, do I need that? Is that something that yeah. I need? And yeah. it's such a huge responsibility um, to have that level of trust from another human being as your as you know the healthcare worker and provider. So I do love that you're talking about like how we should be creating these relationships, but uh, simultaneously um, looking at them holistically and taking charge of their overall health. And haven't you also found with this that perhaps the doctor makes a recommendation, goes out of the room, and the patient goes, I didn't understand that, and asks a question like, they're too intimidated to ask the, the dentist about what the recommendation was, but they, they want to ask you so they can understand. So there's also this role the hygienist plays in helping make sure patients understand why the recommendation for the care and what that really means. Correct? 100%. Yes. Yes. All right. So let's take a look at this. 
I took, um, this was done a couple of months ago, and this is from the National Network for Oral Health Access. This is their listserv where clinicians, administrators, and so on talk to each other. And on this particular day, which ended up being our previous podcast, they were talking about the role of the hygienist and whether or not a hygienist needs a dental assistant. And I have shared these. What's great is these were public, so I've copied these word for word off the listserv. But this is such an important subject. We already just established the critical role a hygienist has in enhancing clinical care and enhancing outcomes. What this also means is hygienists need to be focused on patients, on patient communication, and on clinical care. What hygienists do not need to be focused on is cleanup and setup of operatories. Now, for some of you, you already have a dental assistant who helps you, but I know for a fact many of you do not. So part of what we're going to look at today is justification for why you need help from a dental assistant. Uh, we've established clinical. You're mm -hmm. also paid more. This is important because in terms of the economics, an assistant is paid less, is very skilled within his or her realm, and is therefore a more cost-effective choice for cleanup and setup and infection control, thus freeing you up for more patient engagement. And when I read what was said here, for instance, uh, dry shields could work instead of hygienists. So I nearly fell off my chair. <laughs> no, uh, dry shields do not replace dental assistants and do not, I mean, they may enhance uh, being able to do a couple of things, but equipment like that does not replace the value of an assistant who can help you do your work. At a bare minimum, having an assistant who can set up a room for you completely, have it ready to go for the patient, uh, take the x-rays for you even, very valuable. And then do the cleanup afterwards. If you could have an assistant who could also help you, especially when you're doing complex patients, that's even better. But at a minimum, you need the support. And I'm going to show you some math that is really going to bring this home. Uh, and I love the one down in the white. I wrote this one down so you could read this above all the others. And this is, we added a hygiene, we added hygiene assistance for access to care since our hygiene program capacity issues and scheduling to get patients back in for appointments. It did increase productivity as well as uh, adding more visits per day. Our RDHs love it and have now been in place for over a year. The additional productivity did show that we could offset the cost of the additional dental assistant also. So the end result of good planning with workflow in a dental assistant is you get to see more patients, you get to give them focused care, and the practice or program benefits with increased revenue, which more than offsets the cost of giving you a dental assistant. So I hope that is evidence number one of what we're talking about. So let's take a look a little bit more at this. If you can add at least a half-time DA, and this is from a successful dental program, if you can add at least a half-time DA for each full-time uh, RDH, your productivity will increase. Our extra DA comes from the extra half-time DA for our full-time dentist. So this was explained. Then they talk about the fact you need two operatories. So their DAs take all the x-rays and they do the things that I described. Uh, we increased productivity from 13 to 16 patients a day, and this is talking hygiene, and our four FTE uh, IDHs are all surplus producing. Well, you think three patients additional per day for an IDH over four IDHs. 
uh, we've just seen 12 additional patients a day. We've given them a wonderful experience and that's absolutely going to improve revenue. So I talked about the impact of COVID, that they were in a deficit, they were in the red. And then by changing how they were working their hygiene, they were able to turn that around. And this ended up being a great victory for them. So wonderful evidence of the importance and role of great workflow that involves DAs to support what IDHs can do. So here I've given you a formula that now takes this to the next level. We have here, if you're a full-time hygienist, that equals 2,020 hours a year total. Now what you want to do to look at your number of clinical hours, because clinical hours are when you see patients is you subtract your annual leave, sick leave, public holidays, CE time, staff meetings, admin time, you know, all of those other things that reduce the number of hours. And you'll find that your clinical hours are likely to be between about 1550 to 1646 clinical hours. Now you take your overhead related, we're not worried about depreciation, that's too much, much. we're just going to take basic operations overhead and apply that to those clinical hours. And you're going to find that your clinical overhead is going to be fairly significant. So it, uh, and I've shown the math here. If you add an assistant, of course, it's going to go up because you've got to throw in the assistant salary and benefits. But once you do that, we start to look at how this plays out on a schedule. I've got an example schedule here. And for those of you who are just joining by sound, take a look at this when you go to the PowerPoint online. What I've done is I've put together a single column schedule, which is how a hygienist works when they're alone. And we look at the fact that you've got really a first 20 minutes where you're seating the patient, where you're taking x-rays, or where you're making sure everything is set up in the operatory and ready to go. So you've got to start at about 20 minutes on those functions. Then um, I'm showing 30 minutes where you're actually with this particular patient. Now, this is just an example. When you look at the schedule, you will see on the left-hand side of the schedule strokes that indicate time that doesn't have to be hygiene time and excess that mark hygiene time. This will vary depending on what you do, but the principles remain the same. And that is you've got set up an x-ray time or whatever that happens to be at the beginning. You've got actual hygiene time. And then at the end, you've got cleanup time where you clean up the operatory, you let it sit for whatever period of time it needs to sit before you finish your infection control and apply your barriers. And then of course, putting your new trays in and everything else you need ready for the next patient. When you look at a single schedule, you start to realize how much time you are not doing hygiene professional things. You are doing support things that someone else can do. And so you take a look at that. And I calculated this schedule based on, and, and I just did a simple encounter number just for the basis of, of, you know, doing something to say, this is what the revenue would be. And I came up with a $900 day based on this. It could be different, but the principles will be the same because then I show a two operatory schedule where we overlap hygiene time with setup time between two schedules. And you'll see this where once again, total chair time slashes represent time that can be spent by someone else or the operatory sitting empty and how you can flow from one operatory to another. And we literally double the productivity 
as well as increasing the number of patients who actually are seen without putting the hygienist on roller skates. What we're really doing is enabling the hygienist to focus on the patient care, finish with one patient, head into the next operatory where everything is set up and ready to go, spend quality time with the patient, finish with that patient and move to the next operatory, knowing that there is an assistant who is going to do all of that cleanup and prep, have x-rays ready and all the rest for the next patient for you. It is dramatic. And you can even get a nice 10 minute or 15 minute break here or there with a really good schedule. So you're still seeing more patients without exhausting yourself, but you're really feeling the value of what you can contribute. So I provided some evidence for you. So when you look at this, you will be able to share this with leadership. Uh, Michelle, before I go on to anything else, any thoughts or comments? Yes. Um, so I'm just sitting here and as I'm looking at that example of the schedule, um, so what I have typically felt when I hear consultants or anyone talk about like a double hygiene column and like having a hygiene assistant, they're actually shortening the appointments. It's so even your time spent with the patient as a hygienist is getting, you know, smaller and smaller. And so I know the burnout that can come with that kind of situation. But when I'm looking at yours, this seems very doable. And what I'm hearing is like, I am getting to do the things that um, really matter to me as a hygienist and me, and I say me as a clinician, Michelle, um, which is doing biofilm management, doing the home care instructions, truly getting after the preventive side of our job and having um, someone's help to help me navigate what that setup looks like and the cleanup. And even when I've seen breakdowns before from consultants, like here's how you're supposed to spend your hour appointment, for instance, an hour. And it's like, you know, 10 minutes with health history, 10 minutes of x-rays. And then it's like four minutes of like breakdown and setup. And I'm like, my wipes, my disinfectant wipes take three minutes to kill. So I don't even understand how I'm supposed to accomplish like a true, um, a turnover of my operatory in a way that's not going to create a healthcare associated infection and that time. So what I'm seeing here seems way more realistic and almost like it will serve my soul better because I'm actually doing the things that I really want to do, which is talk to the patient about their overall health their and how to prevent more oral disease. Exactly. So this is really essential. And once again, this is why I believe in two operatories is because that operatory has after each patient and COVID's not going away or COVID impacts aren't going away. Whatever world we have right now, I think we can expect is going to continue. That operatory is going to need to sit for a while um, with whatever air circulation is doing. And, and I'm talking generally because everybody's doing different things. But the fact is, I can't imagine it's going to be or should be less than about 20 minutes at the end of every appointment for what is truly needed to let that room rest, um, make sure it's completely disinfected, air has moved, whatever it is, then get barriers on and then do setup, which is why it's so important to have an assistant do all of that. And we'll talk more about standardization in a minute, but we want to make sure when it's done, it is done to standards or more. And mm. it is absolutely correct when the hygienist is walking in to take care of the patient. The hygienist doesn't look around going, oh, um, I don't have a scaler. That should never be a question. It should be there. Um, along with that, and you hit on something important, I've just done an example schedule. What's really important for each hygienist and practice acts also vary is to look at exactly what you are doing. The, the health history, and like I said, I'm talking more about health histories, like really discussing 
uh, what's going on with the patient because you will have time for that. Um, like I said, diabetes, how are you doing on your diet and exercise? What has your, what has your primary care physician advised you and how are you doing with that? Um, let alone the actual time you need to do a profi scaling, root planning, whatever it needs to be. You need to have standard times for those kinds of things. So your scheduler knows how much time you need within the chair time. So we have total chair time, which could be an hour and a half, um, but the subset of that is your special time based on you. And even with all of that, you are going to be more productive because you are going to be with a patient while those other functions that are non-hygiene are happening. So absolutely critical. All right. Now let's take a look at some other things because over the last year, I think we've all been impacted by the stress of COVID, whether we've really realized it or not, it's just been an underlying stressor. So we've all had that. And then of course, the life has continued. Um, and I think COVID has just compounded any stresses we've gone through. It's just been a bit more compounded. Well, when we're looking at what hygienists do, there are stresses, there are barriers to clinical care, chronic little frustrations can be as hard on your system as a big stressor. In fact, chronic little stresses can be harder on you than a big stressor. If you take a big event, you know it's fairly finite, you get through that. But if you're going to work every day dealing with the same frustrations, with the same little stresses, those really wear on you. And, you know, ultimately our bodies break down. You know, I think when we get, this is my theory, this is not medical, but when we do get a cold or flu, I wonder if it's because our bodies are finally going, all right, you know, I've protected you long enough, you need a rest. Um, so we want to be able to manage our work environment as much as we can. And so there are some things we need to understand. Uh, one is what are the efficient, what are the essentials for treatment and efficiency and staying on time? What can you control? What could you manage with some assistance on what is beyond your control? Now, for instance, beyond your control could be a patient that suddenly does an outburst that you weren't expecting. You know, um, those kinds of things can happen. But most of the things we deal with are within our control and absolutely within our control with management support. And so we want to look at what can we do to optimize our work environment to eliminate frustrations. For instance, is our equipment working the way it should? Is suction enough, for instance? Do I have um, equipment that enables me to provide best possible care? Um, and there are variations on how scalers work, ultrasonic scalers, and so on, looking at what's going to get the most optimal result. And anymore, we're also looking at, at what technologies reduce aerosols? That's an important part of consideration. And having those discussions. Um, for instance, when we look at brands, and this is my recommendation from experience, you can use a private label brand for a mirror and explorer, but I really love a brand like, let's say, Hugh Freedy, if I'm looking at a Gracie, because those are those key instruments that you want to have super reliable, super sharp, super protected. So maybe you're looking at those kinds of things as you're looking at what instruments make a difference for you and what technologies. The other thing we want to look at in core elements of success 
is how your facility is laid out. Uh, I will talk about this some more, but one of the important things that boggles my mind is that uh, programs can have a room set up just for hygiene and rooms set up just for the doctor. My first recommendation is all rooms should be usable for everything. This enables you to adapt whether it's something that has made patient care go late, whether it's a piece of equipment which has broken down. There are so many different things that can require you to move from one room to another. If all the rooms are standardized, essentially for anything that needs to be done, you have got flexibility. This flexibility not only helps you, but it helps your dentist because you're not suddenly going, oh my goodness, treatment room number five is not working. The chair is stuck in the upright position. There is no way the patient can climb three and a half feet to get into that thing. You know, and I'm making fun of it, but you know those kinds of things happen. Then you want to be able to manage your instruments and materials. And we'll talk closely about that and have the right tools for managing your clinical environment. We've talked about the staffing paradigm. Now let's talk about some other impacts that will manage your time and what I call a global treatment paradigm and chair assignment, which is what I just talked about. Global treatment paradigm means the entire office works for everyone as does chair assignments. So while you may have a primary chair and a secondary chair, that can be flexible because you are not locked in. All right, let's take a look at how these play out. Um, let's look at what you need. So here are some key things that you need to be able to do and that your space needs to allow you to do. Medical history update. Uh, oral cancer screening, perio screening or perio exam, uh, doing intraoral camera images for your dentist, and taking appropriate radiogra radiographs. Now, that could be done by the assistant uh, under your, even your supervision with standard orders, and doing a home care evaluation, uh, getting to the root of what they are doing. And as you, when you look at the screen, you'll see hygienists and assistants, because this is the combination of how you get this done to make this efficient and effective. Next, um, if you take away only one principle today, a dental assistant for hygiene makes both of you work your weight in gold. I have given you some workflow setups in the screen to help you with this very thing, like what the assistant does in advance, how she or he sets things up, how they handle sterilization, what the assistant does when the patient arrives, and so on. So I've given you some examples that you can take away and you can discuss with your leadership and with your team for adoption. Um, next, um, let's talk about overlearned behaviors as stress reduction. Uh, it's all about standardization. So think about how you learn to tie a shoelace or how you learn to drive. Maybe, uh, you know, when you were learning to tie a shoelace, you were probably doing one bunny ear, two bunny ears and over. I bet you haven't thought about bunny ears in years when you've tied a shoelace. It's the same with driving. You're not coming up to a corner going three seconds from the corner, I need to hit the indicator. It's all of those things. So when you're coming up to a red light, you're not going, oh, I better put my foot on the brake. When we do things over and over, they become automatic. And the more automatic they are, the less stressful they are. We just get in the ammo of doing things without thinking about them. This reduces stress, it increases speed, it eliminates errors, it assures compliance, and it enhances patient experience. 
So think about where you start for this standardization of the operatory. So if you were to walk into any operatory blindfolded, reach out, you would know what you were going to touch where. So now you are focused on the patient because you're not going, where is the curette? I know it was here a minute ago. It's right where it needs to be. Um, uh, the flow feels better and you are feeling far more in control. And seriously, it's, it does reduce errors and it can reduce injuries. I mean, my, I think about my husband who um, is actually very good at doing work around the home and, and some pretty complex updates to the house and all the rest. He got himself a new, I think it was a jigsaw, but he got a new saw he'd never used before. Um, about the second time he used it, he managed not to have the safety screen in the right place and hit the edge of his finger when the saw hit a knot in the wood. So it went right to the top of his middle finger on his right hand. It did a little fracture of the bone and he needed a bunch of stitches. So he got that injury, but the other thing was it had to be, uh, the, the way it was bandaged was this giant bulbous bandage on his middle finger that he had to keep elevated for 10 days. He walked around giving everybody the finger, including when we went to church and the bishop of our church. So aside from the fact he got injured, um, 10 days of giving everybody the giant bulbous finger. So when we are looking at overlearning, we are avoiding these kinds of situations, um, reducing injuries, increasing speed, and really enhancing the patient experience because they're not sitting there with their mouths open unnecessarily. Okay, often uh, we have the challenge though <laughs> of making an existing space work, which means you could have different shaped operatories uh, just because you know this is just how the clinic started out. But if you can still standardize as much as you can within those spaces, that makes a difference. The next thing is working with your team on an actual patient flow. Be intentional about how the patient is from the moment the patient walks through the door into the clinic, through the clinic. Be intentional about what that experience is and standardize. You won't be tripping over each other. The next important thing is standardize your storage. All operators should be kitted out exactly the same way. And quite frankly, very few things should be stored in your operatory. When you're looking at operatory, the things like patient bibs make sense, infection control makes sense. Um, even a drawer for uh, local anesthetic makes sense. And maybe a drawer that's got your favorite instruments that's just yours or glass that, but very few things. So uh, yeah. Which, in procedure tests. Michelle, you look like you want to talk about that. Well, I was just saying, I think the, I personally use like the color coded method from Zerk. So having procedure tubs and the trays and everything in it so that everything is centralized in that procedure tub. And for me, what I have found with a team, it prevents people from also sticking dirty hands where they don't belong. <laughs> like, you know, trying to open up a cabinet or whatever, you carry your procedure tub into the room and then you can take out all of your armamentarium for that partic particular procedure that you're doing. And it also, for me, has kept me from, as a temp in an office that has used the Zerk or any kind of color-coded method, really, um, looking like a fool in front of the patient because I don't know where something is. Oh, it's the, and you know what? We're doing a little bit of an ad here, but I have to say I love the Zerk system too. And they actually provide a materials list to help you think about what should be in each procedure tub, which is absolutely brilliant. So yes, um, color-coded procedure tubs, and then you should have, and you can laminate this, 
you should have a standard amount of each thing that belongs in that procedure tub. So when that procedure tub goes back, it gets restocked precisely to standard. And that way, when you open it up, you never worry that something's going to be missing. There's that reassurance, everything is there. And then as you said, your unit dose for what you're going to be doing. I'm amazed. I've even heard dentists say, well, if I use pickups, I can open a drawer. And even with my bloody fingers, I can use pickups to grab something out of the drawer. No, you can't. That's a no-no. You know? <laughs> I would like to edit into this like a, a round of applause if we could. Because <laughs> no, you shouldn't. <laughs> and and the other thing is get everything you don't need off the counters, including education materials. We've had research for years that shows that aerosols go all over the operatory. So the only thing that should be out is what you're actually using for that patient. And if you, the other thing is, there may be some things you have out where you actually should put like maybe a bib over the top so that those don't get contaminated until you know you're using them. But what we don't want to see is all of this stuff just sitting out on counters that drives me to distraction. And I here's the other one is like glove boxes in the operatory because splatter is going onto those gloves and those glove boxes. Those need to be out of the way of where the aerosols were going. So we could go on forever about this, but seriously, let's keep those operatories clean, let's unit dose. And I absolutely, they're the only way to go with standardized procedure tubs that are refilled exactly to standards between patients. Okay, now let's talk about inventory management too because what we were just discussing manages inventory if everything is in a procedure chart you have just enough it's being circulated it's being replaced um, I, and everything has an expiry everything of importance has an expiry when you're just using a limited amount in a procedure tub and then unit dosing, all of that gets cycled. I have seen so many operatories with where various things, bonding agents, sealants, composites have been stuffed in lower drawers and forgotten about. These are expensive materials. I mean, you know, a good bonding agent, $100, $130. We want to get through that. We uh, don't want it to evaporate. We don't want it to lose its effectiveness and we don't want it to sit down in a bottom drawer and expire. So part of what we're also discussing is not only patient experience and hygienist experience, but it all also ties in to cost effectiveness of product use and selection. Um, and that's another thing, as you're looking at supplies, there are some things where a private label can work just fine, like a bib. A bib can be private label. But there are also products you use where you know that effectiveness is it varies. For instance, if you've got a product like a sealant that is more tolerant to adverse environments, like if it gets a little contaminated, it's still not going to fall out that's a great product. Even though it may cost a little bit more, the fact is you're going to be successful and you're not taking multiple steps. So products that enable you to get uh, optimal outcomes in adverse circumstances that don't require lots of extra steps are really worth their weight in gold. And then the savings can be with private label on these other products that uh, you know can just be universally simple like a suction tip um it, you know those can be private label uh even profi paste can be private label but boy those things you're really permanently wanting to use in the mouth get a great brand it's also interesting when you look at things like fluoride varnish there is research that shows you which ones work well 
uh, which ones have the best uptake. Ironically, some of the best uptake is not the most expensive. You can find some of the best uptake in the medium priced. So applying evidence-based research and best practices really, really valuable when you're determining materials. Um, Michelle, I see you nodding. Is there anything you want to add to that as well? No, um, I think you're spot on. As a person who has worked for companies that um, created name brand products, and I I agree with you totally. Like it, it you know, there's some things that we can manage with uh, it being like an off brand or a white label. Um, but there's some things that we really do. Uh, well, and then not just from a brand, like the product, but also the customer service of the product is the yeah. other side of it. Or I'm like, it's, it's worth the, what feels like an additional expense. Like you will, you will benefit from it. I promise. Yes, you know, this is an interesting thing because there's already been some research done in dental schools about how certain materials are used. And it's amazing how many instructors are actually not training like students to use the product according to the manufacturer's instructions. And yes, there are manufacturers who are so good about coming in and providing you clinical instructions so that you do get the best results out of that. That's worth its price in gold as well. Um, another personal experience uh, in that was uh, we were updating a, a condo that we decided to move into and I went to one of the national home improvement stores you can imagine one or the other and I was looking at different kitchen cabinets and I had the same experience where the manager said look um, I know this cabinet looks like it's really good but the customer service from this manufacturer has been so bad. If something goes wrong, we struggle to get it fixed. Whereas with this brand over here, their support is fabulous. My experience clinically and in the dental industry, I immediately go with, let's go with a manufacturer that's got great customer support. So good point, Michelle. Now I've included a picture here because I love this picture of how empty this operatory is. Because to me, this is how an operatory looks until we get it all set up for the patient. Almost nothing to see. All right, I did provide a list here of some things you may wanna consider can be stored in an operatory. It's pretty limited and they should all be away in a drawer, but you'll notice it is not a lot. So once again, in doing this PowerPoint, I hope I'm providing with you reference material that you can look at and discuss with your team as, you, as you're thinking about what you're going to do differently. And of course, we discussed that. See, we got things a little bit around the other way, Michelle, but I think these are also Zerk pictures. Um, but you can see what I mean, whether whatever brand you use, um, the principle is exactly the same. And I've shown a setup of a restocking where it's got everything you need for a Profi, for instance, and no more, no less, which is exactly where we need to be. Um, so the other thing, uh, and you gave a perfect example is you go temporarily into an office and you don't want to look embarrassed in front of the patient. I think about how often I've been to the dentist and I've lain there with my mouth open with a tooth isolated while someone was looking for something. Your mouth gets kind of achy pretty quickly. So what's good for you is also good for the patient if we can not have our patients lying there with their mouths open while we're going on a search and find that is even better so all of it comes together for what we call the global treatment paradigm which is good for the hygienist good for the practice or program and really good for the patient and the patient management that the productivity, the elevation of the hygienist role, the 
efficiencies you can create. The time you spend with the patient now becomes more meaningful, more uh, impactful on the patient, and the patient is walking out feeling hopefully inspired to take better care of themselves. They're also feeling like they've had great care today and they're feeling like what their investment is in their oral health has been really, really worthwhile. So as you look at this, here are some basic principles. Know your practice acts. Know everything a hygienist can do. Know everything an assistant can do in your stage. Train to the most expanded function possible. Learn true forehand of dentistry techniques. Um, and this is an actual technique. This isn't just forehands. This is how you actually safely pass instruments and anticipate what is needed because you're standardized in each procedure. So when you finish one thing, then we know, all know what the next thing is going to be. So you've got two brains looking at what's going on and knowing what's going to happen next. Standardize how you do every procedure because that is key to forehanded dentistry. Um, and then the, the guiding principle along with this is the person who is legally allowed to do the work, able and qualified to do the work, who is paid the least has the primary assignment. Um, that doesn't mean when the flu hits or someone takes vacation, everybody doesn't jump in to help out with additional things. This is basic primary assignment for everyday situations. If it doesn't hurt to create a spreadsheet and actually look at all the functions and actually put together a plan for who's going to do what. The recommendation as well is uh, you will be well compensated because you're doing that which is of greatest value, but it also gives assistants a chance to learn new skills and be compensated better as well. Um, lastly, I want to talk about evidence-based technology. Technology is constantly changing and keeping up on technologies that can make a difference, for instance, lasers. Uh, can do so much more now for perio as well as clinical. Uh, that looking at those and evaluating them against what kind of patient care is provided can be immensely valuable. Once again, with the impact of COVID, um, if there are tools and technologies that reduce aerosols, uh, I know, for instance, there are lasers that actually kill bacteria, kill viruses. Uh, and reduce aerosols at the same time. Those I see as becoming more and more valuable as we move into this very much changed world that we have. Well, our time has been ticking away. Um, any thoughts, Michelle, as we look at the, the last thoughts um, as we close this up? And I will say we're starting to see AI become a reality. And I think in the next year, we're going to see AI-assisted diagnosis and recommendations. I think that is very, very close. No, I think uh, you have done a beautiful presentation. I don't even have very much to add. I mean, this was uh, such a good, I guess, reassessment and on truly a paradigm shift to how we practice that is overdue. Well, thank you. And I hope for those who listen in and look at the PowerPoint that if find one thing to take away, use this if you're struggling, use these resources to go to management, to go to leadership and have a meaningful discussion on on just even one or two things that you could do differently that could make a difference for everyone. No, this is um, this is fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time to put this together and to present it to us. And um, if anybody has any questions, may they give uh, contact you? Yes, absolutely. Glad to help. Great.
Yeah, we will put um, Andrea's uh, contact information in the show notes. And again, um, head over to the show notes so that you can click the link and see this presentation. It was so great. We don't usually do our podcast like that, but this was too good to pass up. And um, Andrea, just thank you so much. Thanks, Michelle. And, uh, you know, best wishes to everyone. Bye. Thank you.